Okay, we are studying the Holy Spirit. We're in our ninth study of the book of the Holy Spirit. We are on page, or excuse me, the subject of the Holy Spirit. We are on page 24 of the notes that you have, the top sheet of the notes that are in front of you. And, but before we get to that, let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Let me uh, share with you a verse that I have just been so enjoying this, this week including what it tells us about the Holy Spirit. Uh, if Romans chapter 15, verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Isn't that a good verse? Uh, the reason I'm, I've, I've been looking at it and studying it, it's the last verse of the passage that we're going to study Sunday morning in our study on the book of Romans. And I just don't remember particularly really being gravitated to that verse before. But uh, that verse has so much in it involving our Christian life, but, but the key is uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. It is very significant in our lives. And so in, in this study we have been looking at the Holy Spirit and his power in our life. We started out by looking at the, the um, nature of the Holy Spirit. He is, uh, he is a person, even though he doesn't have a body. He is a person, he has personality, and he is God, and he is uh, divine, eternal, has all the characteristics of God. Well, we then looked at some of, yes, Oh, Romans 15, verse 13. Good, okay. So, we've seen not only who he is, but some of what he, is, what he has done, beginning in creation, and then his work in our salvation. Tonight we come to a very important subject concerning what the Holy Spirit does, and that is that he gives us spiritual gifts. And um, all of a sudden I realized I forgot to introduce our guest, who is Rod O'Neill, who is sitting over here. Rod is from a suburb of Louisville, Kentucky. He, 40 years ago, was in the Marine Corps, just a kid, stationed at El Toro, and a new, new believer found his way to our church and got grounded in God's Word, and Marine Corps sent him to uh, Andrews Air Force Base, even though he was in the Marine Corps, and all over, and then for years has been settled in Louisville, Kentucky, and last Last uh, September, when Terry and I went to the National Quartet Convention in Louisville, we were able to be with Rod and Karen, went to their church, and got to be in Rod's uh, Sunday school class, adult Sunday school class that he teaches. So that was a real, real joy. But what prompted me to realize I'd forgotten to introduce you was talking about this uh, subject of spiritual gifts. Uh, Rod is here for a couple of days on business, sent me an email, I'm, I'm in Irvine, can we get together Wednesday night for dinner? And Bible study and so on, sure. Well, Rod had no idea what we're studying. And uh, when he pulled up in front of our house, uh, he pulled out a brand new book that he has just written, and it happens to involve this very subject, spiritual gifts. And I couldn't believe it when I said, Rod, do you know what we're studying tonight? <laughs> so, um, uh, you never know what God does in his timing. Interesting thing. So, but the subject of spiritual gifts is something you could write books on. We won't, uh, we won't go into all of that detail, but we'll be in the subject uh, for several weeks. So looking at your notes, beginning on page 24 on this subject of the spiritual gifts, you know, almost from the beginning of the church on the day of Pentecost, almost going back that far, uh, the church has been faced with two extremes when it comes to spiritual gifts. One is the abuse of spiritual gifts. And in fact, when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the letter that we have is 1 Corinthians, a big section of that book is Paul straightening out the Corinthians because they were abusing this very subject of spiritual gifts. It goes back that far. So that's one extreme. Then the other extreme is the failure to appreciate the importance of spiritual gifts. So we want to we want to navigate uh, all of that in the next few weeks and uh, see that spiritual gifts are important 
and uh, what God's word teaches about them and so on. So we need to carefully look at what the Bible has to say about spiritual gifts. That is our textbook. Now you'll notice on the outline, it is, uh, or on the notes, it is helpful to distinguish between the spiritually gifted men who are given to the church and the gifts which are given to individual believers. Now the gifted men that God has given to the church are listed in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So let's turn there. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 7 through 14. So our broad subject now with the Holy Spirit is spiritual gifts. But we want to take a look at not so much the spiritual gifts that you and I might have at this point. We'll get into those uh, even tonight. But we want to start out by looking at another aspect of the spiritual gifts and that is some, some gifted men that God has given to his church. And uh, Ephesians 4 is a great place to go for that. Verse 7, he says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now here he's talking about the gifts that every believer has, at least one spiritual gift. And he's going to be talking about that, but he prefaces it by mentioning that this gift that God has for us is according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, when he gives us a spiritual gift, he also gives us the grace. He enables us to, to put into practice and to serve God with that spiritual gift. And by the way, uh, the most common a uh, Greek word that's translated gift in regards to spiritual gifts is a word that you've heard even if you've never taken any Greek and it's the word charisma from which we get the word charismatic. That is the most common word in the New Testament referring to spiritual gifts. However, that is not the Greek word that's used here. Uh, the Greek word that's used here is a totally different word that has the emphasis with the word that it is a gift that is totally free. Now, that is a redundant statement except for the fact that in Greek there was a word concerning a gift that had with it the idea that it was free. Uh, in the book of Romans that word is used and when I was in that chapter in Romans quite a few months ago I mentioned that many years ago and Rod would remember Ralph Dean uh, Ralph was uh, a, a godly man, wonderful man and also a very astute uh, uh, kind of scholarly kind of person and one time I had used the expression concerning our gift of salvation God's free gift and Ralph came out of church and, and he said, but Dennis, that's redundant. How can there be a free gift? If it's a gift, it's free. You don't have to say it's a free gift. And yet, when this word is used in Romans, most translations do put the word free with it because it's an emphasis of that word. That happens to be the word that is, is used here uh, for uh, each one of us, the measure according to uh, the measure of Christ's gift. It's, it's emphasizing to us that this gift is nothing that we've earned, nothing that we deserve. It is purely a gift from God, free, no strings attached. Then verse 8, therefore it says, now uh, he's going to quote from Psalm 68 verse 18. And the reason he's going to quote this verse is he wants to show that Jesus Christ has the right to bestow gifts on his church. And the picture of Psalm 68 is of a Jewish king returning to Jerusalem after a, a battle in which he's been victorious. And in those days when a general would come home victorious, he would bring what was called the spoils of war, which many times would include captives, soldiers that he has taken captive. And so in Psalm 68, it's written by David. David probably had had that experience. But Psalm 68 is one of the Psalms that's not only speaking of that day, but it's looking ahead to the coming of Christ. 
And Paul quotes Psalm 68 and applies it to Christ's victory after Christ's victory on the cross. When he ascended to heaven, he has this in mind. When he ascended on high, when Christ ascended to heaven, he led a host of captives. That is Christ in his battle, at his war that he has won at the cross. He comes into heaven, as it were, with the spoils of war, which includes people. People who used to be the slaves of Satan are now the slaves or servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, and he gave gifts to men. Again, that's quoting from Psalm 68 verse 18. And it's the idea here referring to Christ that when Christ ascended, just like a victorious general would give gifts to people that he knew from the spoils of the war, so Christ has the right to dispense gifts. And in this case, the gifts are gifts to the church of gifted men. And so uh, uh, he says in verse 9, and this is in parentheses, and saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? That is, is simply a way of saying he just, uh, here he is, eternal God, and he came to earth, uh, humbled himself to the, to the nth degree, totally humbled himself coming to this earth. Verse 10, he who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens and so on. But here's, here's what we want to look at. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles. So the first of these gifted men that he gave to the church are people that are called apostles. Now we know the apostles as being 11 of the original disciples. Of course, the 12th disciple was Judas. Judas betrays Christ. He uh, uh, hangs himself totally disqualified from continuing as a disciple. But the other 11 disciples after the death and resurrection of Christ are called apostles. And that becomes an office in the church, gifted men that God gave to the church. Now, one of the requirements to be an apostle was that they had to have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one on the earth today who saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. So therefore, there are no apostles today. And there have been no apostles since the death of the original apostles. And in another place in Ephesians, it says the foundation of the church. The church is built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Well, once the foundation is laid, you don't keep laying more foundations. And so we had that first era in which we had the foundation of apostles. We don't need to be appointing apostles uh, in our day. They, they, they were uh, part of the establishment of the church. And it's through the apostles that we have the New Testament and, and so on. Well, so that's the first group of gifted men. The second group uh, are the other part of that foundation of the church, which according to verse 11, they are the prophets. Now the prophets communicated from God his revelation. And that's why we have the New Testament, because the revelation of God of the New Testament was revealed uh, through these men uh, that he had, he had chosen. They are, in other words, a mouthpiece for God. When the prophet speaks, they are speaking God's word that God has revealed. Now, when we get to the gifts that God gives to people, we will see the gift of prophet there. We're not going to see that one tonight. We'll see that one next time. But we'll get into that and how all that fits with God's revelation and so on. So there's apostles, there's prophets, and then there's evangelists. And the definition of an evangelist is one who declares God's good news. And they were in the early church like pioneer missionaries are today. We send missionaries to places that don't have a church. 
They don't have believers yet. For instance, uh, we have several missionaries that our church supports who are called church planters. Uh, Jeff and Courtney Hogue in Cambodia are church planters. When they went to Cambodia to the area that they are in, there were no believers. And so they came and there have, there have been people who have come to salvation in Jesus Christ. A church is being planted there. Uh, they would fit in this category of the gifted men, and in the case of Courtney, a woman, that God has given to the church of church planters, uh, which would be the category of evangelists. So there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then the last one that he has in his list is something that we're familiar with. In the ESV, uh, and I say last one, because it's actually two, probably, in your translation. But there is a connection between the two, and you can even put a hyphen between the two. Shepherds hyphen teachers. Uh, The grammar of the Greek, as Paul is writing that, would allow that, that to make it one particular uh, office. Shepherds hyphen teachers. Uh, So what is a shepherd? Well, Uh, Other translations will translate it pastor. That's the word that we use most of the time today. However, what is a pastor? That word means shepherd. So the more biblical way of putting it is a shepherd. Because Jesus said he is the chief shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And the New Testament talks about under the chief shepherd are some under shepherds. And that's what the pastors are today. So what does the shepherd or pastor do? Well, when it comes to sheep, the, past, the, the, uh, the shepherd takes care of the sheep. It's, his biggest responsibility is to feed the sheep and uh, to care for the sheep when they get wounded and, and uh, sick and, and all of these things. And so God has given his church an office of gifted men who are pastors to teach God's word, feed the flock. And so that's why you have the last of those categories, and that is teachers, men with the supernatural ability to explain and apply God's truth. Now, there are people in God's church with the gift of teaching and teachers in that sense, and we'll see that later on tonight, who are not necessarily pastors. It's not only pastors who are teachers, but uh, you cannot be a pastor without being a teacher. That is a very integral part of the job of being a pastor. So these are these gifted men that God has given to the church. When we talk about spiritual gifts, they should be included. Now the chief passage on the subject of spiritual gifts is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. We're not going to start at verse 1 of chapter 12 and go through verse 14, or chapter 14, but in the next few weeks we will often refer to verses in chapters 12, 13, and 14 as we look at the whole subject of spiritual gifts. And let's begin with that by turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. <clears throat> and you'll notice on your notes, spiritual gifts are sovereignly bestowed. Uh, we speak of God as being sovereign, as being Lord. And uh, uh, something that is done by the king or the sovereign or the Lord, we would then call it sovereignly. So our Lord, the head of the church, has given to the church spiritual gifts. Uh, so, the, so look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, 12, 11. All of these, he's been mentioning spiritual gifts, that's what the all of these are, uh, are empowered by one and the same spirit. That's an important truth for us, to realize that the spiritual gifts that we are going to talk about are empowered in our lives by the Holy Spirit. That, by the way, is part of the difference between a spiritual gift and a natural talent. Uh, Everyone has talents, 
Now, not everyone recognizes that they have a talent, but we've, we've, we've all got some talents buried somewhere. And, but that's not the same thing as a spiritual gift. A natural talent is used with our, our human energy and it achieves human results and so on. But a spiritual gift is empowered by the Holy Spirit himself. And so the spiritual gifts are sovereignly bestowed. And verse 11 uh, continues, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So the key phrase there is as he wills, according to the plan of God directed and done by the Holy Spirit, we are given one or more spiritual gifts. And that is the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. You and I are never told in Scripture that we can pick the gift. It would be nice if we could, oh, I would like that one and that one. But God in his sovereignty has given spiritual gifts. So that point. The second point, every Christian has spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 7. Look at verse 4, 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, and that's capitalized in most translations, because of course it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, it, it, it's given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the whole emphasis beginning in verse 4, is we have this variety of gifts. Every believer has at least one spiritual gift. You cannot be a Christian without having a spiritual gift. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that uh, every Christian knows what their spiritual gift is. There are some Christians that, that don't have a clue. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be that way. And we're, we'll see a little bit later some ideas on how we can identify our spiritual gift. But particularly an immature believer, new believer, uh, may not be aware yet of his spiritual gift. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have one. Uh, the Spirit of God has given every believer, just as the Spirit of God indwells every believer, so the Spirit of God has given every believer a spiritual gift. Um, turn over to 1 Peter 4.10. Continuing with this idea that every Christian has a spiritual gifts, 1 Peter 4.10. Uh, and here again, he's just mentioned a couple of gifts. And then in verse 10, as each has received a gift. Doesn't get any clearer than that. Each what? Each believer has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. There's the idea there again of the sovereign bestowal of the gift. It's a, it's a gift of God's grace. It also uh, has the idea of God's varied grace. That literally is God's varied colored. It's like a, a, a piece of cloth that has been dyed with a pattern of many different colors. So God's grace shows up in different colors, that is, in different gifts and different people. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture uh, that is there. And um, we are then to use it, not to serve ourselves. The gifts are not given for our exaltation, for our puffing ourselves up, but it's used to be serving the Lord and to serve other people. So, continuing with this thought, every Christian has spiritual gifts. When we were born physically, we possessed natural talents. When we are born again, we now possess spiritual gifts. And the Christian, with our gift, 
is pictured in other places in the Bible as functioning as parts of a body. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 12 to 27. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 12, this key passage on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The picture he has here is of a body, physical body, for just as the body is one and has many members, you know, it has the outward members of the fingers and the nose and the toes and the arms and the legs and, and everything else. And, but then it also has inwardly, it has the spleen and the pancreas and the heart and the brain and you name it. Uh, so we have all of these different members. And all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So our physical body has all these different parts, but it's one body. All fits together. So it is with the body of Christ. It's not just that, that uh, the Spirit of God indwells every believer in the body of Christ, but he's, in, he's, in, he's gifted every believer in the body of Christ where that, that person has a function, has a role, has a ministry in the body of Christ. And, and we're all needed. When, when someone is missing from the body, uh, there, there's a big hole there because there's ministry that they are to, to fulfill. Verse 13, for in one spirit, um, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And of course, it's a ridiculous analogy, but it's getting across a point just with our physical body that the foot would never say, well, I'm, I'm no good because I'm a foot. I want to be a hand. It's, it's that uh, terrible for a believer to say, I don't like the position that God has put me in the body. I want to be the missionary, or I want to be the pastor, or I want, to, I want to have this gift or that gift, and so on. Verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If something would be lost if the whole body were an eye. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would that body be? If, if our body were one big tongue. And what a monstrosity. So the spiritual body is not going to be all one gift. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. You know, they tell us that if we... Um, if we have a toe amputated, to us, you know, what a big deal is the toe? But you lose a toe and it affects your balance and your walking. Our pancreas, no big deal. We try to live without one, you know. Uh, can't do it. Verse 22, on, on the contrary, parts that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Verse 23, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable. There are parts of the body that, um, you know, we cover up. We don't want everyone to see. And, uh, and yet there are other parts of the body that are of greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modest, modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. We don't cover our faces and so on. Uh, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So tremendous analogy there that every believer is like a part of the body 
and needed with his or her uh, spiritual gift. And again, spiritual gifts are given to obtain spiritual results. Natural talents are given to obtain natural results, but spiritual gifts, spiritual results. And they produce eternal achievement, which brings eternal glory to God. Well, turning the page, we then, at the top of page 25, we've uh, alluded to this. Spiritual gifts are given to serve others, which is a great reminder that um, we're not to be focused on ourself. Everything's self-centered. Oh, I got to make sure I'm doing okay, and I'm, I'm getting money, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and so on. It's all for me, 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 me. As a Christian, it's the opposite. We are to serve others. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Interesting little uh, sidelight from the Apostle Paul. He's not uh, talking uh, and teaching particularly about this subject, but in, in his writing, a, a great principle comes out uh, by looking at how Paul saw the use of his gift Romans chapter 11, or, or excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you. Paul, at this point, has never been to the Roman church, and he longs to see them. And he says, I, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Now, that sounds like Paul wants to help them have a gift, Right? But unfortunately, that's, that's really not what he is saying. I, it's too bad it comes across that way in just about every translation. But, but what he's saying there is, I long to see you that I may use my spiritual gifts to strengthen you. If anyone would have had reason to glory in his own gifts to, for himself, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But he says, I'm anxious to come to Rome so that I can use my spiritual gift to strengthen you. Uh, that, that's what he is saying in verse 11. And so therefore he says, that is that we may be mutually encouraged. Uh, it was his desire that they would then use their spiritual gifts to minister to him. As he would use his spiritual gift to minister, in this case, to strengthen them. Would be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So our gifts are for the purpose, like Paul, of strengthening others spiritually. However, whatever form that might take with the gift that we have. Uh, then you'll notice on your outline, spiritual gifts are given by God so that his glory might be displayed. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 again. 1 Peter chapter 4, we looked at verse 10, but uh, in 1 Peter, verse 10 goes on to verse 11. So 1 Peter 4, 11, where he talked about, as each one of us has received the gift, we're to use it. Verse 11, whoever speaks, because some gifts are speaking gifts, such as the gift of teaching, Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So behind the use of our spiritual gifts, yes, they're used to serve others. But even that, isn't the end. The end is that God would be glorified. And he is glorified as we serve him by ministering to and serving the other members of the body. Then we have, uh, next on, the, on your notes, some gifts are more effective and essential than others. Just as we already read the passage in 1 Corinthians that some of the gifts are, 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 are some of the parts of the body are such as I mentioned the pancreas you can't live without a pancreas can't live without a heart you can live without a toe without a finger without an eye other parts of the body even some of the internal organs we we get our appendix taken out when that uh, ha has a problem and 
We do fine without that, but you can't with, without a heart and so on. So there are different gifts that are more effective and more essential than others. That doesn't mean that if we have one of those gifts that is not as essential and effective that we're no good. We're, we're needed too as part of the body. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Our first time to look at that third of those three chapters that are the uh, major teaching passage on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14.5 <clears throat> First Corinthians 14 5 now I want you all to speak in tongues and we'll talk about the gift of tongues um, either next time or the time after that uh, but uh, now I want you all to speak in tongues but even more to prophesy so he says um, as far as more essential the gift of prophecy is more essential than the gift of tongues the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. And we'll get into all that uh, in a couple of weeks. Th then down in verse 19, Nevertheless, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others, so that would be the gift of teaching, um, than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he says the gift of teaching is more essential than the gift of tongues. Uh, the next point uh, I've already alluded to, spiritual gifts are not the same as, uh, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped over one. Back up a bit. Spiritual gifts are to be used in love. So those three chapters in 1 Corinthians, you have 12, 13, 14. What's the middle chapter? 13. What's the theme of 1 Corinthians 13? It's the love chapter. Everyone has read and sung and knows 1 Corinthians 13. Rarely do people ever put it in the context that it's in the context concerning our using our spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts in themselves do not make Christians, but their use is, is motivated by God's love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, that brings glory to God. And the New Testament emphasizes the role of love. And of course, love is the first of the nine uh, fruit of the Spirit that's listed in Galatians 5. And without love and the humility that accompanies love, uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit are thwarted. Turn to the first three verses in that famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men, that's one of the spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues. If I speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but I have not love. I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, something you get tired of. Have you ever been somewhere where there's just this clanging gong and it just seems to not stop? Uh, verse 2, if I have prophetic powers, gift of prophecy is another of the spiritual gifts, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, another spiritual gift. And if I have all faith, another spiritual gift, so as to remove mountain, but have not love. I'm nothing, even though I have this very showy gift. Verse 3, if I give away all that I have, we're going to see probably tonight, one of the spiritual gifts is the gift of giving. Let's say I have the gift of giving and I, I'm, I'm really exercising it and I'm giving away everything that I have, including my body if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love. I am nothing. That is so important in the subject of spiritual gifts that they are to be exercised in love. And then again, spiritual gifts are not the same as natural gifts and talents. Then the next point, which is important, but is controversial. And that is, some gifts were temporary. And um, so I do believe from Scripture that some gifts have ceased. And we'll talk about that next time, why why I would believe that and how does the Bible say that and so on 
and then get into those gifts. But what we want to look at tonight are the permanent spiritual gifts. So the first one, number one, is the gift of teaching. It is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. The gift of teaching is the supernatural ability to explain and apply God's word. Now I say supernatural, not in the sense of something mystical or something like that, but supernatural in that this is, is driven by the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, in the life of the person who's teaching. The teaching gift does not claim to have supernatural knowledge of the truth. But what's involved with the gift of teaching, and by the way, it is different than the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is a prophet speaking as the mouthpiece of God. The teacher is not speaking in that sense as the mouthpiece of God. But the teacher is given an ability by the Spirit of God to take the Bible and make it clear, make it understandable apply it uh, to people's lives. Now, here's something that we also have to realize, almost kind of like a paradox. All believers are to teach. No believer is to say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching, so therefore I don't teach anybody. Uh, let me give you some verses. For instance, um, Matthew 28, verse 20, part of the Great Commission given to the apostles and in turn passed to all the next generation, the next generation go into the world, make disciples, teaching them all things that I have commanded to you. So there's a command, not just to the people who had the gift of teaching, but uh, to all believers to be teaching. Second Timothy 2.2, 2, a wonderful verse where Paul told Timothy the things that you have heard from me, these in turn entrust to others that they may be able to teach others also. So you've got a, a chain reaction there. I get taught the word of God, and I'm, I'm saying I as John Doe or Jane Doe Christian, I am taught the word of God. I am to turn around and teach someone else, and they are to turn around and teach people that they know. So again, it's not just the pastors, it's not just those with gifts of teaching, but every Christian is to find someone who knows less than they do about the Word of God and to teach them. Just as you should be finding someone who knows more than you do and be taught by them, and then you turn around and teach someone else. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And... Um, so every believer is to be a teacher, but yet there is also this gift where God has, has gifted some to be teachers, where they, they um, just are given an ability from the Lord to understand it and then to apply it and help you to understand it as well. And so uh, the gift of teaching is, is part of the foundational truth for the church that we do need teaching. If we don't have teaching, we are going to be, as Paul said, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Second gift that's permanent, the gift of serving. And that is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Now the gift of serving uh, starts with a motivation. And by the way, I think motivation is a good word to use with each one of these. Um, the person with the gift, they have a motivation. There's just something within them that's just pushing them and driving them. It's almost it's like it's part of their nature. That's part of this having this spiritual gift. And so the person with the gift of serving has the motivation to meet needs as quickly as possible. There are some believers that um, you just see this in their lives over and over again. They're the ones that, that are quick to see a need. I, I don't, that's not my gift. It doesn't mean I don't serve. 
but it's not my spiritual gift. And I, I often pass over, I see, but I, I just don't recognize always the needs that people have. But a person with the gift of, of serving, they just, they, they just, something about them just zeroes in on that need. Oh, and I would love to meet that need. That's part of the motivation of the person uh, with the gift of serving. Um, I don't know whether we should get too much into names on this, but for those in our church, uh, you look at a person like Gary Edson. You know, I, I see him all over this because he is always seeing needs that everyone else just kind of passes over and then just has, has an ability to meet those needs. Now, he wouldn't like me telling you that, so don't tell him I said that. Uh, all, but again, here's something that we do need to realize. All believers are to serve. Uh, Galatians 5.13 uh, is, is telling every one of us, of us as a believer to serve one another. Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 and 24 is telling every one of us as a believer that we are to serve. So let's not fall into the trap of saying, well, I don't have to serve because I don't have that gift. We're all to serve. But the person with the gift of serving, they're, they're, they're the one that's going to kind of uh, show us the way on how to serve uh, in, a, in a godly way. And that's, that's their motivation. The third one, and a um, couple of different terms for this, the gift of leadership slash administration. And that is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Now, what is this about? Well, the person with this gift has the ability to see the overall picture. Well, I know that's not my spiritual gift. I wish I had that. I, 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 I don't always uh, see that. And so they get to see the long-term picture and then clarify the goals that you need to have to reach it. And they are motivated to organize those who are responsible in order to get those goals achieved in order to achieve the long-term picture. So it is, in one sense, it is administration. In another sense, it's leadership. And they also seem to have an ability to know what can and cannot be delegated. And they just find tremendous fulfillment in seeing all the pieces coming together and enjoying the finished product. Then the fourth one is, and by the way, I do not have a verse saying every believer is to, uh, is to do that. But number four, the gift of exhortation is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. And the gift of exhortation, or we would call these people exhorters, they have the ability to stir people to act on biblical truth. And that involves several things. It can involve encouraging, encouraging. It can involve comforting. It can involve admonishing. Um, and often the person with the gift of exhortation loves to see it in steps of action. So that's kind of like administration leadership in a way, but it's different. Where they want to, to encourage and comfort and get this person on the right track and it's very important to them as they see. And I see how you can do that. Here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. Terry, my wife, has the gift of exhortation. And I cannot tell you all the times through the years that she has mentioned to me in regards to my teaching. But Dennis, tell us how. Give us the steps of action, you know? So I don't always think in those terms, but she does with the gift of exhortation. Now I do see a verse telling all believers to exhort one another, and a couple of verses, Hebrews 3 verse 13 and Hebrews 10 25. 
So all of us are to be used of the Lord in encouraging and exhorting others, but there are these who are especially gifted in that way. Turning the page to page 26. Oh, this is a good one. I wish everyone wished they had this gift. And that is the gift of giving. Romans chapter 12 verse 8 mentions that gift. Now the person with the gift of giving uh, has, seems to have the ability to make wise purchases and investments so that they have money left over to give. Because they're just, there's just a motivation inside of them. They want to give. And particularly in, in two areas. Number one, for the spread of the gospel and the work of God. And then secondly, uh, to meet people's needs. And uh, givers just delight in discovering that what they have given is an answer to prayer either from the ministry they've given to or the person they've given to and so on. But wouldn't you know it, there are verses in the New Testament that do tell us that all believers are to give. So we can't say, eh, I don't have to give because I don't have the gift of giving. Eh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, every believer is to give. Some verses that teach that. Uh, Matthew 10 verse 8. Luke 6.38 Romans 12.13 so that's Matthew 10.8 Luke 6.38 and Romans 12.13 and then on top of that two whole chapters in the book of 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 talk about to everyone in the church about their involvement in giving so we are all to give, but not all of us have the gift of giving. By the way, people with the gift of giving don't want their names put on a wall. Um, they, they delight in just keeping themselves in the background. And it's always amazing the ministries that are really big on raising money on television and so on. Um, you know, I don't know if I should name names or not, but the name that comes to mind is Schuler up at the Crystal Cathedral, you know, when all of that was being developed. And send in the money, and we'll put your name on a brick, and we're going to put it on the walkway so that everyone will see that you have given money. And the crazy thing is they, they would love for people with the gift of giving to give all this money, but a person with the gift of giving is turned off with that. Now, obviously, a lot of people gave because they have a lot of bricks with a lot of names on it. But um, I don't know how many of those had the gift of giving because people with the gift of giving are turned off by this whole thing of publicity. It just seems to go along with that, that gift that they have. But it's a wonderful gift and certainly uh, God has, has blessed many ministries by, as a result of people with the gift of giving. But then on the other hand, the majority of, of, of gifts just like to our church are, are not the big gifts, but they're the small gifts. Well then there's a sixth one and that is the gift of showing mercy. And that's in Romans chapter 12 verse 8. <clears throat> People with the gift of mercy have an ability to detect joy or distress in an individual. They're kind of like they have some antennae that are just out and they just pick that up. And they have an ability to show compassion and sympathy to people in such a way that their uh, distress and their anxiety or whatever these emotions are that they're going through are eased. It's a wonderful gift. Praise God for people with the gift of, of mercy. But it's one of those gifts that's kind of in the background. It's not showy. It's not out there prominent to lots of people like the gift of teaching. But oh, the, the ministry that is done behind the scenes by people with the gift of mercy. However, again, this is a gift that is something we are all to do. All believers are to show mercy. 
Uh, Colossians chapter 3 of verse 12 tells every one of us as believers to show mercy. But again, there are these uh, these limited number of believers who are enabled by the Holy Spirit to do it heartily and effectively and for the Lord and so on using that gift. Then number seven, there is the gift of faith. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. Now this is not saving faith. Uh, every one of us, if we're a Christian, we have saving faith. We have put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, we are saved uh, by, by grace through faith. So it's not saving faith. It's also not the daily living faith that we are to have. We are, every one of us, to be living by faith every day, trusting him, not trusting ourselves, but trusting him. But it's a special ability to trust God in the face of overwhelming obstacles and human impossibilities. Uh, and it's primarily exercised towards God through prayer. So it's, it's not so much that the person with faith is going around talking to everyone about their faith, but this person is exercising their gift through coming to God in prayer. And on the basis of a person's strong faith and their praying and so on, others are helped and served and so on. There are a couple of Christians in church history who I think of and wonder if they had the gift of faith. One of them is Hudson Taylor. He uh, was missionary in China, started uh, what's called, what was called the China Inland Mission. And um, he did something that was radical in his day, hadn't been done before. They had missionary organizations that were out there raising money to send their missionaries. And Hudson Taylor said, I don't believe that's how God wants to do it. We're going to trust God. We're going to, go, we're going to take our needs to God in prayer. And we're not going to tell people our needs. We're going to tell them to God. And uh, read the biography of Hudson Taylor sometime and see how it all worked out. God did an amazing thing uh, through Hudson Taylor and and uh, China Inland Mission, which today is called OMF, Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Another one lived in the same era. In fact, they were friends, and his name is George Mueller. And he is very famous for the orphanages that he had in England. Again, he lived by the same principle. He had all these orphanages, hundreds and hundreds of orphans that had to be fed and clothed, and that takes money. And it was his policy, we're not going to ask anyone. We're not going to tell anyone our needs. We're going to bring them to God and have faith that the Lord is going to supply. And you read the story of George Mueller and you read stories like one day the orphanage was out of milk for the kids and George Mueller's praying. And the milk wagon, in those days, you didn't get your milk at the store. A milk wagon drove by. And the milk wagon came by, broke down right in front of the orphanage. The milk isn't refrigerated. They didn't have refrigerated trucks. They've got to do something with the milk. And so they knock on the door, can your kids use the milk, you know? Same thing happened one day with a bread truck. And, and all of these stories uh, come out of George Mueller. But there is, in Scripture, that gift of faith. I have a hunch. Most of the time, we don't know so-and-so has the gift of faith. Uh, this, this is pretty much ministry of, that they're having uh, with God in prayer. Then the eighth one, the gift of helps, and that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And this is helping others, often in unnoticed ways, similar to uh, the gift of serving, but it is listed as a different gift. The Greek word helps has the idea of taking the burden off of someone and putting it on someone else. So the person with the gift of help sees this person with this burden and they take that burden on themselves to lift it from the other person. And uh, also certainly people with the gifts of helps are behind the scenes helping those with other spiritual gifts, such as 
My spiritual gift is teaching. But there are so many people behind the scenes, many of them with the gift of helps, that are doing this and that and so on, which if I had to do all those things, I wouldn't have time to study and to teach and so on. People behind the scenes with the gift of helps are certainly uh, helping me uh, in the ministry that I have. It's not a showy gift or glamorous, and unfortunately it's often unnoticed and unfortunately often unappreciated, but very, very, very important. Well, we're out of time, time but just briefly to uh, point out at the bottom of the sheet there how to discover our spiritual gift. Uh, here are just some, some guidelines. Number one, make sure you're a Christian. We're talking about spiritual gifts, so it would only be for those that have the Spirit of God, so a Christian. Number two, make sure you are not grieving the Holy Spirit, as we've talked about that in Ephesians 4.30. Since it is the Holy Spirit who makes known his gift to us and then works through that gift, it is quite obvious that sin will hinder us from discovering our spiritual gift. Third, concentrate on others. The purpose of our spiritual gift is to serve the body of Christ. If we're not involved in the life of the body, there will be no basis or purpose in discovering what our spiritual gift is. And the more we concentrate on the needs of those around us, the more the Holy Spirit will be free to work through our spiritual gift to meet those needs. The fourth one, take note of what you find your joy in. Your spiritual gift is not going to be something that you just dread because it's the Spirit of God putting that motivation within you, it's going to be something that you find joy in. And then lastly, ask mature Christians what gifts they see operating in your life. Now that's not an infallible uh, answer to what your spiritual gift is, but it can be part of the clues that point out to you what your gift is. And by the way, I believe that every Christian has one of these that we've gone through tonight. But that's another subject. Well, again, next week we're not meeting, the week after we're not meeting, and the week after that we're not meeting. The next three Wednesdays we're not meeting. That third Wednesday, uh, we've just decided there will be a third Seder dinner that week. You already know there's going to be one Monday and Tuesday now. Those are full and there's going to be one that third Wednesday that we're not meeting. And, but the week after that, we'll be back and we'll continue on the subject of spiritual gifts. But what date is... Pardon? Uh, does anyone have a quick... quick? Yeah, 15th is that third Seder, so 22nd. We'll be back. Okay. Okay, well, let's close in prayer. Father, how we do thank you that you have gifted us. You've gifted your church with gifted men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And then you've gifted every believer in the body of Christ and how we thank you for that. And Father, we pray that um, we would know better where we belong in the body as far as spiritual gifts and that we could be used of you with that gift through the power of your spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.